Okay, so good morning. Um, I'm thrilled to be the first cab off the rank this morning, even though it's not even 6 a.m. And I have to say, this is the very first time <clears throat> I've ever uh, given a presentation of any description, personal or professional, at this hour. So uh, please bear with me. I've had two coffees and I think I'm going to be ready to go. Um, I would like to invite everybody in attendance this morning to take three deep breaths with me. So let's do that together, shall we? And again. And one more. Breath is a fundamental part of uh, the work that I do and very much embedded into my explorations of desire, which I'm going to share with you this morning. So I'm going to start by inviting you to reflect on some varied definitions of desire. And desire for the context in which I'm going to be speaking about it this morning, all revolve around the theme of wanting. Often we tend to associate desire with horniness in contrast with a nuanced combination of ideas, thoughts, feelings, and values encompassing gender, identity, action, expression, validation, spirituality, and so much more, especially relevant in GSRD contexts. I want to make a distinction between sexual identity and sex practices, which speaks to a little bit of what Dominic was saying earlier about the name change <clears throat> in GSRD, as it's well established that sexual identity and sexual practices, one does not necessarily inform the other. And while many of you may be exceptionally well-versed at working with the mental health needs of GSRD clients, today we're going to talk about their sex lives, or I'm going to talk about their sex lives. And what I mean by that is how they fuck, or how they don't fuck, what they do or don't do, regardless of their intersecting identities, and what defines satisfaction for them on their terms. We are allegedly having less sex than ever before, but while we struggle to even define what sex means, especially in alternative and queer cultures and contexts, today I'm going to argue that sexual desire is less about quantity and a lot more about quality. Today's presentation, I don't seek to debate how much sex is enough or too much or even too little, but instead I'm going to focus on giving rise to what creates richness within eroticism and its counterpart desire and why it's important if, in fact, it is. I'll explore how contemporary understandings of desire, so what I mean by that is being in the mood, are often too narrow to serve us in clinical contexts, and I'll offer an alternative framework that's more inclusive and encourages a less passive and more embodied response to desire as a pathway to health, pleasure and well-being, whether solo or partnered for all allosexuals. My approach is trauma-informed, but not trauma-centered. It's directive, it's existential and somatic in conjunction with humanistic and narrative influences. I'll argue that therapeutic models that center trauma as a single story narrative may be valuable in mainstream therapy where healing is the incentive, but these practices fall short in desire therapy because the motivator in eroticism is rarely, if ever, about experiencing neutrality. <clears throat> what soothes a dysregulated nervous system makes way for a safety, and this is a core component of consent culture, healing, and critical sexology, but it may not spark the enthusiasm clients seek in trying to make sense of desire outside of the concept of horniness. Desire therapy is very different to trauma therapy. To clarify, I'm not implying that consent is unhelpful. On the contrary, I am suggesting that consent culture, in fact, needs to step up its game to include and center 
complex power dynamics, including risk and arousal, as crucial elements of desire interventions, very similar to what we find in the wisdom of our BDSM and kink communities, and in so-called vanilla communities and cultures, as well as these kink cultures. So in other words, I propose that in desire therapy, our inquiry is not what soothes you, but what ignites you and invites arousal. And how do you manage risk? Today's presentation is about the paradox of safety and taboo as the center of the erotic inquiry. I often joke with my clients that sex isn't logical and that trying to solve sex problems with logic usually creates more problems. But actually, I'm not joking. I am quite serious because the truth is that when clients, I've never had the experience and possibly this has been your experience also, that I've never, you've never had a client come to you and say, I want to have really logical, reasonable, measured sex. I want to have sex that's very, very specific and very, very regimented. Usually people will talk about wanting to want sex and they'll talk about things like passion and desire and freedom. They don't usually talk about sex in the context of being measured and controlled. So desire in the context with which I'm talking about it today is much more about developing a framework that encompasses these visions of that are broader and less about logic and less about a linear process, but more about giving ourselves permission to expand and le less with less of a focus on some of the more traditional elements of desire in, in particular horniness, things like hot bodies and orgasms and more about what desire means to us as an internal locus of satisfaction. <clears throat> Therefore, I'm actually much more inspired by the question, why do dogs lick their own balls, posed originally by the comedian George Carlin. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the answer to this philosophical inquiry, uh, the answer is because they can. I think the riddles of human sexuality hold more gravitas in dogs as pleasure seekers than anything that we may discover from the likes of evolutionary psychology or big pharma that they can offer us. But of course, I digress there. So when therapists, as, uh, as we are, focus only on what's wrong in a sex narrative, we miss the answer that's right in front of us, which in this case is because they can. As therapists, we're often trained almost like bloodhounds to sniff out pain rather than pleasure. But pleasure isn't simply an idea. It's a practice and it's a feeling. It's a felt sense that extends beyond the limitations of behavioral, cognitive or psychodynamic models. And it's embodied and it exists within the environments and contexts that produce it which include our sexual identities in GSRD communities, but are not necessarily bound by them. If the context is hostile to arousal, if the default to risk is fear, fear must be honored as part of the story, but not the entire story. So I invite clinicians to reframe the traditional inquiry of centering what's wrong and instead to focus on what's right. What conditions and contexts allow pleasure and desire to thrive? Clients have this information within them already. Our locus of inquiry as therapists needs to expand to bring this erotic knowledge into clearer view, which also means that we as therapists must be willing and skilled enough to dive into these spaces, despite our own discomfort and shame that may come with them. So <clears throat> before I go into more about my uh, theories on how we can work with desire and certainly the practices that I've cultivated over the last 10 years, to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm just going to share and do a little recap of some of the more 
uh, contemporary models of desire theory that some of you may have encountered in your training. Uh, my understanding is that many of you are not uh, sex therapists necessarily, but you're psychotherapists. So I just wanted to give you a little overview of uh, the models of desire that are commonly understood, or actually some of them less common, um, that I'm going to be drawing influence from today. You don't need to be super familiar with these. I just wanted to give us all a heads up so we're starting at a relatively similar level. So one of the first models that you're probably familiar with is the Masters and Johnson model, which is certainly uh, one of the most well known. And it is often still used today, perhaps more so in a, in a medical context than in a psychotherapeutic context. And it tends to look like this, that it's a, a, an understanding of sexuality very much of its time, 1966, with a distinctly heterosexual and phallocentric overview, um, recognizing in its, in its own way that sex is effectively a linear graph like this that starts with excitement, leads to a plateau, leads to an orgasm, and then to a resolution. Some people would argue that that is how sex is, uh, and many others would say, no, 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 there's so much more to it. And so one of the main criticisms of this Masters and Johnson model, while of its day was very, very revolutionary, uh, it doesn't take into account the emotional, psychological, uh, and, and even spiritual aspects of sex that inspire many people, including ourselves and perhaps including our clients too. So in contrast with this linear model, uh, it was another model by Rosemary Basson. And as a, on a personal level, I actually prefer this model a lot more. Um, it's obvious just by looking at it that this model is quite different. It's a circle, it's not a line. And the difference being, other than the circle and the line formation, is that with a circular model like this, it tells us that we can start anywhere we like. With the Masters and Johnson model, we have to start with excitement. It implies that we have to be excited about approaching sex. Whereas with the Basson model, we can really start anywhere we like. And Basson suggests to us that perhaps um, the emotional component might be more important before we get to this level of arousal or desire, or she suggests that the stimulation needs to be there, that the desire doesn't necessarily come before arousal, which tends to be the model that we observe in more linear traditional models like this, where we have to have the mood first and then the goodies follow, Basson suggests. No, it doesn't have to be like this. It can be in any order that we like. Following on from here, <clears throat> uh, a couple of other models that I've been particularly influenced by is Luland's willingness model. I'm not sure, again, if many of you are familiar with Luland. She's a sex therapist who was working in the 80s um, and worked primarily with uh, lesbian communities. And it was through her work that the concept of the lesbian bed death came up. And so she spoke um, and wrote rather at length about the notion of willingness being that in order for sex to be uh, on the agenda, that partners have to be willing to do it. And I think that this is quite a reasonable uh, assessment, even though it tends to fly in the face of some of our contemporary understandings of what makes sex valuable. Um, there's something about this model that I think is particularly helpful. And the last one I want to share with you today, uh, which is not especially new necessarily, but uh, Peggy Kleinplatz has written extensively on uh, a theory based around the, what they're calling optimal sexuality. And in this, there's um, a ton of research about what actually goes into the notion of optimal sexuality and otherwise what makes sex good. And in essence, Peggy asks us, is the sex you're having sex worth wanting? So it really, really invites us as clinicians to take a much stronger view around describing the actual sex acts and describing the contexts in which sex happens and inviting clients to have much more um, teased out, nuanced discussions with you and or with their partners about the really kind of explicit step-by-step -step aspects of 
of how we actually do sex, whatever that means to us. And, and of course, these things, especially in our respective communities, can be very broad. Moving on from here, two more elements, I think, of desire that we need to address before I can go into explaining to you how I have done some work with these things, is looking at the notion of spontaneous desire, which is often the way that the desire is framed in the mainstream. It's certainly framed like this in Hollywood films. Um, it's certainly portrayed like this in porn. And it's essentially this notion, and I particularly love this image of these hands kind of clambering for this hot thing that it just comes up out of nowhere and it's exciting and, and you can't help but I just, oh, I just want to have this thing. And that we tend as a, as a culture, as a society, to default to this understanding of desire that, you know, you're just there in the supermarket and all of a sudden you're on the floor having sex of some kind because, oh, you know, just looking at those kiwi fruit it's got you really excited and it, it, that's just how it works and so often when clients come into therapy and they're like oh I want to feel you know I want to feel desire again they're often talking about this kind of thing but more contemporary research shows us that for a lot of people not all but a lot of people actually experience desire in a much more nuanced way which is called responsive desire and I often use the analogy of the effect of the moon on on a body of water when i'm describing this to my clients that it's depending upon the context in which the the sex is happening or not happening will determine how we respond to it so just like the moon's influence on water sometimes there is you know the water there's it's a sort of rushing sensation sometimes it's retreating and just like water sometimes our desire freezes sometimes it heats up sometimes it bubbles over sometimes it dries up and then other times it comes back like a torrent this is what responsive desire speaks to and it gives clients permission to understand that this idea of the spontaneous hot desire, while it is a thing, it's not really a thing for a lot of people. And it's certainly not a thing for people who struggle with desire, often people who struggle with desire in the context in which I'm talking about it with you today will probably lean more towards having a responsive desire template, which helps them understand themselves a little more. So, I'm just going to have a sip of water because uh, I'm a little parched. Okay. So, um, and one other distinction I want to make before I move into my research is a distinction between desire in contrast with arousal. So for the purposes that I'm talking about today, when I'm talking about desire, I'm talking about... <clears throat> the mental, emotional, contextual, uh, and psychological elements of desire being something that we have um, somewhat of an, of an amount of control over, not entirely, but we, there, is a, there is an element of this that we can bring ourselves to and that we can control. In contrast with arousal, which is the physiological element. So that's including things like engorgement, lubrication, erection, wetness, heart rate, swelling, things that tend to happen more uh, automatically. And I will sometimes make a, a comparison that arousal functions in a similar way, perhaps to digestion, that we can certainly assist it by making sure that we eat foods that our body responds well to. But ultimately, the digesting of food happens at a relatively automatic level. We don't really have to think about it that much. I suggest that arousal is often the same, that it tends to be an automatic response that happens whether we want it to or not. And sometimes this situation operates in contrast with desire, that arousal can happen, but desire is not happening, for example, because the mental part or the emotional part is disengaged, or sometimes vice versa. And also, I just wanna highlight that these things are not necessarily mutually exclusive, although they can be, and often it's when this is going on that clients will present to us uh, for work in a therapeutic context around desire. <clears throat> now, what does it mean to treat desire in the clinical room? 
And what problems are we actually solving? And why bother solving it? In any other context, if a client told us that they didn't want something, for example, if they said that they didn't want to paint their living room orange, or that they didn't want to eat meat, or that they didn't want to take a holiday in Bali, we would say to them, well, of course, that's, uh, that's completely reasonable. You don't have to do any of those things. But culturally speaking, not wanting sex can have a far greater impact on the quality of our relationships because relationships can and do fall apart over not wanting to have sex, whereas not wanting to paint your living room orange may cause a, a bit of an argument, but it may not necessarily end in the breakdown of a relationship. And so being able to talk about sex and being able to talk about wanting to want and talking about pleasure is important because the old couples therapy trope about creating intimacy first and then good sex follows, in my experience, is a lie. If anything, intimacy, while comforting, can be a barrier to deep erotic exploration as outlined by Esther Perel in her book, Mating in Captivity. And this is a very, very different issue in the therapy room. So for this reason, it's not uncommon for clients to come to therapy convinced that they are the problem rather than the problem being the problem. And this is a framework that I use that I draw on from narrative therapy by uh, Michael White, who is the creator of narrative therapy, came up with this notion of the problem being the problem that the person is not the problem. And this is important to remember because historically sex has been pathologized and eroticism has been demonized by our professions. And it has happened to the point where that industries have been created around this demonization to reduce and corral it. And uh, Silver is going to be speaking a lot more about this today. So for many of us, clinicians included, we don't have a framework for understanding desire outside of a pathology narrative. And this is really important because... I want to ask you this question for those of you who have had experience working with either a low desire, which is often a self-diagnosed thing because we don't really have a measure of how much desire we're supposed to have or not have. So a self-diagnosis of low desire, how many of you have had the experience of clients saying, well, you know, I want to want sex again. And if again, in any other context, client said to us, you know, I want to like pineapples again, or oh, what's going on there? Oh, uh, I want to like pineapples again, or I want to like tomato soup again, or I want to like blue cars again. It doesn't really make sense. But in sex, wanting to want is a hot topic, but yet it's not even logical. So I'm interested to know, in this context, when they're saying I want to want sex again, what are they really saying? What do they want us to help them do, explore, or feel? And most importantly, what's the incentive according to them, not according to us? And I want to ask you to ask them, what will change if they want to want again? What is it about wanting to want that creates permission for them sexually? And why does it matter for them? What's the payoff if wanting to want changes? Or what's the shortcoming if it doesn't change? This has been the line of my inquiry for the last 10 years. And this is some of the insight that I'm sharing with you today. And the rest you will see in my online class called the Desire Series with a forthcoming book of a name that I have yet to work out what it's going to be. But if you are interested in going into this further or using this as a reference for your clients, please uh, let me know about this at some point after this presentation. Now, moving right along. Horniness is um, something that we tend to overwhelmingly associate with desire. And it, it really comes from medical approaches and behaviorist models looking to simulate and stimulate horniness that we tend to understand it as the sole or certainly the most likely inspiration for desire. But horniness is only one piece of the desire puzzle. And while it's relevant, it doesn't usually apply to many people, and especially 
not people who may be struggling with desire in long-term relationships, people on various medications, menopausal people, the infirm, the immunocompromised, the elderly, the body dysphoric, the body dysmorphic, and so on. And it definitely doesn't apply to people experiencing self-diagnosed low desire, but as a line of inquiry, sometimes we can get a little bit fixated on it. So by colluding with clients around the relevance of horniness as a sole marker of wanting, I want to invite you to reflect on what happens to our explorations of desire with them. What effect might that have on our questions and suggestions to help them explore more? And what would wanting to want make possible for them that feels inaccessible now. The trouble is that horniness is a privileged concept that overrides these discussions and that both society and clinicians tend to prioritize horniness as a sole driver for sex to happen. And by privileged, I don't mean privileged as an accessibility issue, but I mean privileged as a dominant narrative. It defaults to models of sex that eliminate other incentives, including wanting to want as its own incentive. Because my hunch is that when a client says that they are wanting to want sex again, our clients are actually experiencing desire in that exact moment. It's, not, it's just not the kind of sex that they want, or sorry, it's not the kind of desire that they want. What they're saying is that they want horniness, which is a very specific kind of desire, but it's also notoriously unreliable. It's like waiting for a bus that doesn't come. And I often use waiting for a bus as uh, an analogy to, or a metaphor to, to help clients understand how wanting to feel horny as a motivator is like waiting for a bus that doesn't come. Because in any other situation, <clears throat> say for example, you needed to get to a party or you wanted to go to a party and you decided that you would take a bus to get there. And so like this person, you're waiting for the bus, waiting, 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 and as notorious as buses are, it just doesn't come. And in the meantime, your friends are going past in their cars and there are taxis going past and there are Ubers going past and they're all, all these people, you know, are going to the same party that you're going to. And then, you know, one of your friends pulls over and says, hey, what are you doing standing out here in the rain? Why don't you get in the car and I'll give you a ride. I'll take you to the party. And you say, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine. Thanks. I'm, I'm just going to stay here and wait for the bus. And so your friend goes, oh, okay. And they drive off. And then the next friend comes and says, hey, you're still here. Why are you still waiting? Because I'm waiting for the bus. In any other aspect of life, if we wanted to get to a destination and we wanted to go on the bus and the bus wasn't coming, at some point we would recognize that if getting to the destination was actually the incentive, we would find another way to get there. We'd take a ride with a friend, we'd hail a taxi, we would get in an Uber and worst case scenario, we would walk or crawl or roll there if we had to. But when it comes to sex, sometimes folks can get very fixated on getting to the party, getting to the party being the sex that we want to have that the only way they will give themselves permission to go there is to go on the bus. And so the bus is the horniness. And so they're waiting for this horniness to come and it just doesn't come. And so they will spend years in this state of waiting for something that's just not going to come. In a, in a context like waiting for a bus, we would never let that happen to ourselves. But with horniness, it's almost a given that we can get away with that because we say, well, I'm just not in the mood. And because I'm not in the mood, I, I can't get to the party. So <clears throat> for people for whom horniness has often been irrelevant or unappealing or fraught with difficulty, defaulting to a horniness at all costs narrative reduces the way we invite clients to explore desire in a clinical space, while also privileging higher desire partners, especially horny partners, and leaving the lower desire or less horny partner to carry the bulk of desire, perhaps in a mismatched uh, libido context. 
limited sex education that most of us have experienced um, generally means limited capacity for self-reflection. Our questions as clinicians need to guide clients into novel ways of exploring their experiences and pleasures. And many of us don't know how to discuss sex at all. And many of our clients don't know how to discuss sex at all. And pleasure is an elusive concept outside of the context of horniness. For many of our clients, the only way that they know how to talk about sex is through the lens of horniness. And if horniness isn't present, they find it very hard to talk about it because they've just never had a framework to do it. It's never occurred to them that it can exist without horniness as the incentive. So when clinicians overwhelmingly focus on what's wrong, we will ask clients, well, why don't you want sex? There must be a reason. And when we default to that setting, the implication is that desire is normal and natural and common. Because remember, as therapists, we're often trained to sniff out problems, but we're generally not trained to sniff out pleasure. An emphasis too in particular cultures around looking for a diagnosis can mean that we want to name desire, we want to name desire as a disorder of some kind. And there can be uh, an inclination to want to look at desire as a problem to be solved rather than a quest to be seized. So in order to get around this problem of diagnosing low libido as a problem, either if we're doing the diagnosing or the clients are doing the self-diagnosing, instead of that, I invite clients to reframe the question of why don't you want sex to this? Why do you want sex or why do you have sex? And this, I think, is the most crucial question we can ask in desire therapy because we are able to when you're able to identify your motivation for sex and hold it front of mind and practice accepting it as your truth when you know why you're doing something for your own uh, rationale your own set of values it's much easier to maintain enthusiasm for it i'm just going to stop momentarily because i can see my screen flashing here, I think. Is it about? No, I don't need to pay attention to that. Okay, pardon me. I digress. <clears throat> it's just something coming up in the chat, Cindy. It's fine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so desire is encouraged in most other parts of our lives. Synonyms can include ambition, incentive, and motivation. We even have things like motivational speakers. But to seek assistance with desire to some people seems ludicrous because we're overwhelmingly convinced that it's natural despite so much evidence to the contrary. So while our attention is focused solely on what's wrong, and how to change it, our gaze is diverted from the answers that might be in front of us, which is our clients themselves, who may know that they want a richer relationship with sexual desire, but simply don't know how. So with permission, we can create a context for GSRD clients to imagine an erotic template that transcends horniness as a sole motivator and ask them instead, why you don't want sex, but rather why you want sex and why do you want this to change? Only in sex is the absence of desire considered unreasonable. It's not about not liking particular foods. We're not usually shamed into oblivion if we don't enjoy capers, for example. But in sex, the expectation overwhelmingly insists that desire is natural and it must come from a spontaneous place, even though for the vast majority of people, especially people who struggle with desire, that is just not their lived experience. Moving on. I have come up with a framework that gives us a different way of understanding working with desire that replaces the concept of horniness, which clients might struggle in the beginning 
to think, well, if, if, if desire is not about horniness, then what is it about? And, and we need to help them uh, scaffold a new way of framing desire. Like we're not going to be taking horniness away from them because horniness is fun. It's, you know, it's fun to be horny. But for those for whom horniness is not relevant, we want to give them something else to latch on to. And so that is uh, satisfaction. Research looks at, uh, overwhelmingly looks at problems. And I think I've established in my presentation so far that there really is a very strong tendency among clinicians to always be looking for problems. It, it's in, it's in the, the essence of our training is to look for problems, which is fine in trauma therapy, which is fine in most other forms of therapy. But I have found that in desire therapy, it doesn't apply. So I'm speaking about this in a very specific context. I don't want to say that looking for problems is bad overall. It's not. In desire therapy, I think it's unhelpful. Um, so instead of looking at what's wrong, I spent some time looking at and, and researching people who described satisfaction with their sex life. So I thought, well, let's look at, let's actually look at what works and talking to people who say, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty satisfied with my sex life. Not that my sex life is amazing. Not that I'm having the best sex ever. Not that sex is, you know, mind blowing. Although sometimes it's that, but simply folks who are satisfied. And based on these interviews over many years, I've come up with a concept that I call the triangle of satisfaction. And the triangle of satisfaction is this, primarily this uh, initial structure here. And there are three points to the triangle of satisfaction that sexually satisfied people have in common. The first point is um, they, they all describe a relationship with curiosity, that they are curious about sex. And going back to the question, why do we have sex? They know why they have sex and they will accept their reason for it, even if it's not necessarily something that they would have thought. To explore that no notion further, there was a paper written by Cindy Meston called uh, Why Humans Have Sex. And in that research paper, they discovered 237 reasons that humans have sex. And I mean, that really just, and I'm sure there's probably more as well, but there, it just speaks to how, uh, how people's erotic motivations are so diverse and so vast. And when we think about go, thinking back to the Masters and Johnson model, which was that linear graph I showed you, and that it's you know just about excitement and orgasm and having a nap afterwards. For some people, that is their motivation, but for so many of us, it's just simply not. So one of the core components of sexual satisfaction for people who feel like their sex lives are satisfying is that they are curious about their own erotic motivations and they accept what they find there. The next point of the triangle is that they make sex a priority. So similar to the person waiting at the bus stop, they recognize that if horniness is not going to be their sole motivator, they are willing and they make it a priority to get to where they want to go. So in this case, sex, um, they make it a priority to get there in another way that they're not going to just wait to get there one way. So if, if the horniness doesn't take them over, um, they will intend to find another way to get there. And this really speaks to the degree to which they make sex a priority and how important it is to them. And uh, the third point of the triangle is the notion of willingness, that they are willing to actually do the labor, pretty primarily of the curiosity and the priority that transcends the notion of being in the mood and invites them to look at their sexual motivations through a much broader lens. So it's almost like we're pulling the camera back and looking at sex overall in the context perhaps of a relationship or a dynamic or something that gives them an incentive <clears throat> to want to do it. And they're willing to extend themselves. They're willing to push themselves past their edges. They're not confined to sex having to look in a particular way. So in the research that I've done with, the, with sexually satisfied people over the last few years, these were the three 
components that I notice that they all have in common as a marker of not what's wrong, but what works. And if we can orient our clients in this direction, it might give us a framework to start having useful conversations with our clients. Now, the willingness component of the triangle also has its own small triangle. Um, and there are three points here of willingness. Clients, uh, people, sorry, <laughs> who, are, who are able to embody the notion of willingness in terms of satisfaction are able to do this level of self-inquiry and they're willing to, to understand what, it, what their motivations are. They're willing to understand what their, why they have sex and what inspires them. They accept what they find there. So again, even if there is some sort of contrast. And so an example of what I'm talking about perhaps is um, I think particularly uh, through a feminist lens, there can be an element of uh, for, you know, I'll talk about cis women briefly, um, a very specific uh, implication that, you know, you shouldn't have sex under any conditions other than because you want to. And so because sex might be something that, you know, you want to want, um, but then there's another part of you that wants to make sex a priority. And so the horniness isn't there, but you might find another motivation that isn't necessarily about horniness, but because you want to participate in the relationship that way, or you think that sex is important. Some people might struggle with making sense of what might appear to be opposing factors, but the people who describe satisfaction in their relationships are able to recognize why they have sex and they will accept that about themselves, even if it doesn't make sense to them or even if it's not logical. And similarly, between partners, there can be an element of partners thinking, well, I'm having sex for this reason, so therefore you should want it for the same reason too. I'm having sex because I think you're hot and so I need for you to think that I'm hot too. So the acceptance element is recognizing that part, you know, partners of however many um, may or may not have the same or similar motivations for wanting to have sex, for why they have sex. And when they can let go of the idea of we have to want sex for the same reasons, it creates an ability to accept what their respective truths are and and orient the conversation back to pleasure and satisfaction rather than well we have to both be on the same page about this that they can be on the same page about it without having to be in complete agreement and the third component of that is is being able to share that information between themselves and be able to really hear each other and not take offense or to not get derailed because a partner experiences desire in a different way from the other. <coughs> uh, can someone tell me how I'm going for time? You've got about five minutes left. Oof, okay. So, um, all right. <clears throat> the next component but because uh, you started I... early, you could have a little bit extra. Oh, okay. So, okay. so yeah. All right. I've, I've only, I've, I'm almost done. So right. that's good. All right. Um, so another element that I like to bring into um, our therapeutic discussions is about somatics. So somatics is being able to use the body or being able to bring attention to the body um, in a therapeutic dialogue. And when we watch children play, for example, who are not necessarily having sex, but there is um, an element of, you know, aliveness in children's bodies. And there is a passion and an enthusiasm that is often replicated in adult sexuality, whether it's pants on sex or pants off sex, that I will make a distinction around those. But regardless of what kind of sex that we're having, um, bringing an element of, of enthusiasm sometimes can be really useful for that. And so looking at children almost as a guide for how that might come about is children when they're playing, and if we look at these little kids here, you can see that in their, in their faces, they are so engrossed in the game that's going on. And I don't know what they're doing, but I just love the enthusiasm on their faces. They're just so all in. And there's none of that internal chatter about, you know, should I be doing this? And is this right? And, and is this appropriate for me to be doing this? They're 
fully engaged in the process and their bodies are leading them. The children, in effect, are real pleasure-seeking creatures. But when an environment that we are in does not inspire or encourage desire in an erotic context, what can happen is that we will internalize that taboo in order to make sense of it. So in other words, instead of being like these children all in, we or our clients can become disembodied. So it's easier to disconnect than it is to recalibrate. And what can happen is that we believe that we're flawed and that we become the problem rather than scrutinizing the systems and beliefs that encourage the problem to exist in the first place. And the difficulty with this is that disembodiment can manifest with stealth. A lot of the time when we're in this disembodied state or a shame state, we, some, we don't even know that we're in it. It's become so ingrained that we think it's normal, but we know that we are in its grip when we feel shame or disconnection about and from our desires. So before we allow our, con our clients to make a self-diagnosis of low libido, let's check the context in which sex is happening for them and how much permission is being granted for them in their context to actually express what they really want. Oh. Uh, there's an increasing body of evidence by uh, a neuro researcher, Dan Siegel, arising from the world of psychiatry and neuroscience that describes in detail how the relationship between the body and well being is mirrored in the brain. So the understanding is that our well being is bi directional. So it's not simply coming from the brain down into the body, but it can also come from the body and back up into the brain. So our capacity for reorienting towards the body by reorienting towards pleasure by almost taking a, a, a mild sort of fake it till you make it approach um, can be much more multifaceted than simply a question of mind over matter. That the truth is we can actually change how our brains respond to sex by changing the way that our bodies engage. This is a much bigger conversation than I have time to share with you today, but I wanted to just invite that uh, concept for you to consider as we move through talking about desire. So when we allow uh, a dialogue to happen with the body and to expand sexual curiosity, it's helpful to connect and stay with the sensations in our bodies. For us to experience erotic desire, it's helpful to explore these sensations more fully as a pathway to greater understanding. Many psychotherapeutic disciplines such as emotion-focused therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, sensory motor therapy, somatic experiencing, uh, focusing and the Hakomi method, just to name a few, all invite a concept of tuning into the body and staying with its response as a way of making sense of the somatic experiences within. And while none of them have any explicit frameworks for addressing sex from a pleasure perspective, their foundations are solid and also can be applied in our domestic erotic contexts, which is something I might share with you another day in greater detail. Um, so the final thing I'd like to share with you, Dominic, do we have time to do this case study or show uh, folks can do that for homework? What do you think? Maybe, maybe let's leave that. I think okay. we're getting close to time now. Okay. Let's so, get them in groups. All right. Uh, uh, the, re the references are there for people who would like to read further about where I got some of my ideas inspired from. And here are your group questions. Um, thank you very much. It's been an odd context not being able to see any of your faces or responses, but I hope, uh, I hope I engaged you enough. So thank you very much. <laughs>